It's time for Tycoons of Small Biz, spotlighting the true backbone of the American economy, the true tycoons of business in America, the owners, founders, and CEOs of small businesses. The show's hosts, Austin Peterson and Landon Mance, are registered representatives of Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation, a broker-dealer, member SIPC, and registered investment advisor. The views expressed by your hosts, Austin and Landon are not necessarily the views of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Let's lean in as Austin and Landon connect with this week's Tycoons. Good afternoon, Tycoons, and welcome to today's episode of Tycoons of Small Biz. Austin Peterson here. I'm here with my co-host Landon Mance in studio for the one time a month that he's here. And it, uh, I got to be honest with you, it doesn't smell as good as it normally smells in here. But uh, we, we are excited to have his, uh, actually his older sister, Dana Mance, in, in, uh, are on the show with us today with Prism Boutique in Los Angeles, California. Dana, thanks for being here. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. I've never done anything like this. Well, that's exciting. We're, we're happy to have you here and, uh, and we're, we're grateful that you would uh, do this for your first time with us. So um, I think, first of all, Dana, we, we, we usually start by having our guests tell us a little bit about themselves personally, kids, husband, wife, any of that kind of stuff, and then kind of just the, the history of how you got to where you are today with Prison Boutique. Would you mind doing that? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, first off, I live in Long Beach, California um, with my husband and my two daughters. Andy is six and Lucy's four. So um, I've been in Long Beach for about 15 years. Um, I love it here. Just felt like when I moved here, this was my place to be. Um, as far as my background, um, I went to UC Santa Barbara, um, graduated with honors with a BA in communications. That was a long time ago. I graduated in 2002. So that's kind of a memory of the distant past. Um, after I graduated, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I knew I was good with people. And I really, um, throughout college, um, developed an interest in fashion. I had always worked retail, so those were the jobs that I had when I was younger and um, worked retail in college. And I moved back home not really knowing what I was going to do, and I got a job as a manager in training for Urban Outfitters in downtown San Diego. So I didn't have any management experience, um, but I did have some retail experience, and they kind of just took a leap and hired me and um, I think right away I, I knew that management was a good fit for me. I'm good at telling people what to do, <laughs> and directing people and kind of, you know, I have the personality for it and, you know, good with managing workflow and different personalities, friendly, um, that kind of thing. And um, I think they saw that I had a future with them. So they moved me up to uh, Costa Mesa area and I got a, promo a big promotion and they moved me to be a women's manager and um, just became part of a team of managing, a, you know, a big retail operation. And then I decided, okay, if I'm going to do retail and I, you know, this is where I, I don't see myself going anywhere else. I really want to be with Urban Outfitters sister, um, which is anthropology. So I made a move over to anthropology, worked my way up through management, learned a ton um, working for those stores. I mean, they're big stores, big management teams, big operations. Um, you know, anthropology is known for its aesthetic. It's just, you know, more elevated than a lot of other retailers. And um, I became a store manager for the first time. I think I was around 20, maybe around 27. Um, so I managed a small store first. I commuted um, over an hour each way into Los Angeles from Long Beach at that time to become a store manager and kind of take that um, leap in my career. And then eventually got promoted to uh, manage a larger operation in Newport Beach in Fashion Island, which is a beautiful outdoor mall. Um, and for about five years there, I managed um, about a $10 million business. Our management team had about management and visual anywhere from, I would say, 10 to 18 uh, in management and then a staff of 50. And I really just learned how to kind of just be in corporate America. Um, although anthropology, I think, definitely sets itself apart from regular corporate America. Um, it is corporate and you have all the le you know levels of management that you're dealing with. And I just worked my way up and um, I had a great time doing it. 
Um, I loved running a business. I loved working with a team. They really did allow us, and they talked a lot about entrepreneurship um, and letting us run our stores like it was our own business. And that was a word that we used a lot and that we had that ownership. Like it was, you know, my store, my team, and um, they really let us kind of run with that and, you know, have the creativity to, you know, do the things that are going to set our business apart from the other stores and to be a leader. And I think I always wanted to have, um, you know, my store be special and to be a leader in the district. And then they actually promoted me to be a uh, operations lead. So I would be sent with a visual partner um, to be in charge of opening new stores um, throughout the U.S. I also did one in Canada. So I would arrive with a partner off the plane and we would get to the store and the store would be, you know, construction would be done and we uh, would be in charge of literally when we leaving, making sure the store is ready to open. So the, the visuals were done, the displays, um, the staff was trained, the management was trained, the office was set up, systems were in place. And it was the most grueling experience. <laughs> I, I think you can only do that when you're around like that 20, you know, under 30, because um, the hours were eight to eight. Sometimes it would be till, you know, 10 p.m., 11 p.m. And I mean, I just learned so much from that experience. At the time, it was just kind of like surviving the experience and being able to lead the team through that and get them ready to open their new anthropology store. But I learned more than I even knew um, with that experience and just working for anthropology in general. I think without all of the experiences and the people that I work with there, I don't feel that my small business would have been, you know, nearly as successful without all those experiences. And I call it my business boot camp, working for, um, yeah, Urban Inc. and Anthropology for just shy of 10 years. And um, I didn't know, you know, what I was going to go and do later. I was just more, you know, in the moment and, you know, rising the corporate ladder and being in charge of these teams and these stores. And it was really fulfilling. But I hit a point where I was like, I was just had like the corporate burnout. And I had always wanted to have my own store. And I just felt that I had to go and try and do it. And I was okay. I, I was like, I know I'm going to be okay if I fail. I'll just have to go get another job. <laughs> so I was really just, you know, and I, I mean, I definitely had a lot of like family and friends that were like, Ooh, Ooh, you're going to leave like your, you know, corporate job with your 401k. And, you know, you work so hard for this company and you, you know, proven yourself, you know, as a leader with the company. And I just, I had to try and, um, I would drive around Long Beach and I found this little space, 650 square feet on the side of like a little neighborhood street and it said for rent and I just rented it. And then I put in my notice and, you know, um, and I left and I did it and my husband helped me, you know, do the uh, build out and I, you know, really opened my business with, I think it was about $15,000 including inventory. So it was not a lot. Um, and we did, you know, my husband did everything ourselves and, you know, um, built, you know, built the fixtures with wood and copper racks. And I, you know, from the beginning, I really identified my aesthetic, like looking back, it was very, you know, it's evolved so much, but my aesthetic for Prism since the beginning has kind of stayed true and kind of stayed the same. So yeah, we, you know, I had never been a buyer. So I was, I was in management. Um, I had never been a buyer and I didn't even know how to go and buy the clothes and how much to buy or anything. And um, I found out what building to go to in Los Angeles. And I walked in, I knew it was market week. And I said, I am here, I'm opening a store. I don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> how do I buy these clothes? And um, I was a natural, thank goodness, all the years of just retail and shopping and knowing what people want and knowing what's going to sell and understanding your customer and just being immersed in, you know, that um, paid off immediately. And I made my first buys for the store and hand, my mom helped me hand tag everything. And um, from the beginning, uh, you know, I, yeah, from the beginning, I had a friend who um, did marketing and websites. And I said, okay, I wanna have a blog. And then I was like, no, actually I'm opening a store. And she's like, okay, well I'll do your website and you need to have a huge grand opening. So she helped me from the beginning, you know, everything was planned out, you know, grand openings this day, we're gonna tease it this day and flyers. And um, so we had a really big grand opening. I would say like 
honestly, like 75% of the people I knew came to just come and see like if I could do it. <laughs> it just showed up and it was, I mean, an unreal night. I was, I don't, it's just one of almost like your wedding where you're like, whoa, this is all happening. And all these people are here to support me. And, you know, having worked with so many women in anthropology, they all love to shop. They all loved my style and they wanted to come see what I was going to have in my store. And the first night it just was a success from the start. And I literally sold out of like, I didn't have that much inventory. And it was like, I probably sold like, let's say, 70% of my inventory. And the next day I was like, oh my gosh, I have to open. And uh, we, you know, I'm gonna, I need to go buy more stuff. It's like empty in here. And from that, I just, you know, I worked in the store every day. And then I had a, a, a girl who worked for me for anthropology. And I said, can you, can you come on your days off so I can go up to Los Angeles and buy more clothes? And she said, yes. And then she started coming every Tuesday, Wednesday, and I would work all the other days by myself in the store, I would bring my little dog with me. And it was, I look back on that as just like such an amazing time. And I got to connect with every single customer that came in the door and really build Prism. Um, and we just had a really good response from the start. Um, you know, it's right when I opened Prism is when Instagram really kind of took off. So we opened in 2013. We just celebrated our seven year anniversary and um, not everybody was selling on Instagram and Facebook back then. It was just, you had just kind of come out, you know, and people would put pictures of like, you know, their personal lives, but it wasn't a business tool at all. And immediately I just started taking photos of the cute clothes, like outfit laid on the floor and girls were like, oh, how do I get that? Like, and uh, you know, we did, we had a website, but it was not an online store and it just immediately from the start you know girls wanted to wear the prism clothing and it just had a really great response from the start and um people would come from afar because they would see it on instagram and at this point we didn't have a very large following but it, we were just growing rapidly um and i had one friend who had been my partner in anthropology um, her Instagram is Ascot Friday and a lot of girls wanted to kind of be like her and she would post about Prism and wear, you know, put on Prism outfits and she just did it to help me out because we were friends and it just kind of snowballed into this thing. We're like, okay, we're going to post the outfit and then people are going to buy it and they would call on the phone or they would, you know, uh, message me their credit card numbers and I would ring it up. And then every night I would go home with like my little bundle of purchases that were going to be mailed out and I would do my homework on the floor in my living room and I would mail out the packages because I didn't have time to do it at the store during the day because people are coming in. Um, and then, yeah, we just, you know, I would hire, you know, one employee and then one more employee. And then um, on the one year anniversary of Prism, I had a, a baby, so Indy. So I had like two or three employees at that point and they were manning the shop and I would uh, walk down with a stroller and I would sit in the store with the baby. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, we just grew. And I think after about um, close to two years, we doubled the size of the boutique. Um, we knocked down the walls and we became a larger boutique. And um, again, our social media following was going and uh, backtracking a little. We launched our website about six months after the store opened and it didn't have good photos and it didn't have that many products. And but we had had this demand, like, when are you going to have an online store? When am I going to be able to shop all these styles online? And, you know, my background is brick and mortar, the customer experience, the store experience, making it beautiful, making the service, you know, making an experience. And that's still tr like my true passion. Um, and I didn't know, I'm not tech savvy at all. Um, and my friend Linda, who did the website and helped plan the grand opening, she helped me do the website and we crunched and stayed up all night uh, getting it ready to launch on the day that we had the launch. And then that day um, we had one sale and we had accidentally priced the ring as $0. <laughs> and we went to contact the customer and be like, sorry, actually like it's $50 or whatever it was. And, you know, I just thought, oh, this is just gonna, you know, all these girls, they want it, you know, they want the stuff. And then that day we launched and like, we didn't sell anything. And that was kind of the start of like building an online store. Even if you have the following and you have this demand, doesn't mean that you're, you know, this business is going to blossom. And, you know, over the years, we just kept working on the online store and building it and, you know, doing photo shoots and 
and, you know, listing the product and doing all the labor, it's a lot of work to run an online store, especially when you're running a boutique. So yes. Um, I think you were asked, you asked me to talk about myself and now I'm just on a tangent. <laughs> That's how it all started. Um, and you know, we were just this little boutique and we got this little online store, um, you know, up and running and that's kind of how Prism kind of took off at the beginning. Do you remember having a conversation with me? Uh, this was probably right before you actually opened the doors. I was, I was talking to Austin about it uh, before the show and I, I don't recall the exact numbers that you use, but you said something to the effect of, you know, if, if I can just sell, you know, a hundred thousand dollars worth of stuff in my first year, like that'll, you know, keep us, you know, keep us afloat and keep us going. I think we can build off of that. And, and then, uh, I, I remember, I, I think, uh, let's just say that your, your store did that in uh, maybe one twelfth the time that you, <laughs> that you thought it was. So yeah, our initial uh, goals were very off. I mean, I knew I was on a side street and I knew it was going to be, you know, I was, it's, you know, you have to build your business and you know, all of that. And I think I was like projecting to do like $300 a day. And I was like, okay, well, I won't pay myself for this many months. And yes, if I, I mean, if I had, done that business I would not be here um still and I definitely like underestimated and was like from the start just kind of like oh my gosh people are like spending money here and they want to wear the clothes and they want to you know tag us and be part of our Instagram and they you know it was just an immediate and I, I still am blown away to this day I'm like oh my gosh like sometimes this little business I can't believe like you know how many customers we have or how much they'll spend or you know women will walk in the store and they'll spend money here with me so it's still kind of shocking but yes those initial numbers would not have worked and you know over the years and seven and a half years like I've seen a lot of boutiques come and go mm -hmm. and you could just I mean in all honesty I can walk into a boutique now and I can tell you how long they're going to make it <laughs> and you can just see that they don't have the experience and the tools and you just you know you have to be good at so many different just like any small business you have to be good at so many different things um, in order to just get the, you know, get the business off and running in those first couple of years before you can afford to hire experts in certain areas that you're not an expert in. Um, but yes, it, it takes time. Yeah. And, and you know me, I, I'm not a, a creative, but walking into your store, I mean, you just immediately, you can just tell, I mean, you walk in and you're like, holy cow. I mean, this is something special. I mean, and clearly your, your skills around, uh, you know, store layout and design and the furniture and the lighting and the smell and the flooring and all the stuff that you have taken into consideration when you built out the store, it's just, it's, it's incredible. And, and on top of that, you know, you've been able to take your business skills that you learned in the corporate world, which is uh, you know, uh, a very common theme amongst entrepreneurs, right? You're, you know, we're working for the big corporation. We see an opportunity to do something different, do something better. And we take those skills and we translate them over to, you know, applying them to building a business for ourselves, which is, uh, you know, something that, that you have done uh, very well. Um, Earlier, let me just. Yeah. I, I would just point out though what what he just said. It's actually more common for people who do what you just did to fail because they came from mm -hmm. a large organization. They were used to large budgets. They they looked at things a certain way, and you moved into I think you said 650 square feet, yeah. and so you know you obviously understood things differently and handled things differently than most people mm -hmm. in your situation do. So. Hats off to you for, for figuring that out early and, and understanding what it takes to make a business survive. You learn, yeah, parts of it. Because, yes, you don't have the budgets and you don't have a team that you're delegating to and you don't have systems in place. But you do learn these certain skills that, you know, I remember the first, one of the first weekends we had like a big sale. There was literally like 10 women with their arms full shopping. And I'm like, thank goodness for all those years where, you know, anthropology, you know, being a manager, it was managing payroll, managing payroll, like, and it was, you know, one of the biggest parts of my job. And, you know, so we were always trying to like cut back on the payroll so we could make the goal and 
all of that. And I'm like, thank God for all those years with no payroll. Like I learned how to like have a smile on my face and host, but also do like 10 things at once. (laughs) There was many skills from, you know, the ground up that you learn, but yeah, I, I agree. I do see people who, um, you know, have this idea of what it's going to be like when they go out on their own only to realize that you have to do all that grunt work yourself at the beginning. And some people just, their brains can't think that way. Um, so it can kind of go either way. I do, you know, people always ask me for advice and I do say, you know, if you want to have a clothing store or you want to have a bakery or whatever it is, is go work for different, you know, different bakeries so you can see what are the strengths what are the weaknesses you know and you can kind of identify what those are Mm -hmm. because you know all of us small business owners have our strengths and weaknesses and try to kind of learn from that yeah absolutely and and as you know which our our listeners may or may not know but uh you know before i started my own practice and owned my own you know business um i was working for a large bank and the reason that I was working for a large bank is because I needed the experience of sitting across the table from people and having conversations. Because when I originally started in the business, I was in the independent space and it's very difficult to get people to sit across the table from you. So uh, being at the bank, it gave me an opportunity to meet with hundreds and hundreds of people over the course of the couple of years that I was there. And it also gave me a look at that side of the table, which is working for a big corporation, building a business for them, them keeping a majority of your, of your revenue. Um, so you're kind of putting your blood, sweat and tears into something that ultimately is, is not your own. And uh, so I was able to take what I learned there and bring that over to, uh, to the practice that I started. So I, I think that that's a really valuable thing that people can consider before they start a business. Definitely. And sometimes you don't even know what you're learning at the time. Yeah. I didn't know I was built, you know, going to use this as building blocks to go out on my own. And, you know, so I do encourage young people is like, take, take what you can from every experience, you know, whether it's positive or negative, you can learn from so much of that. Yeah, absolutely. So earlier, um, you mentioned your social media following. Mm-hmm. So you've got a pretty substantial social, social media following. So um, can you talk to us just a little bit about how you have built that up over the years, but also how does that directly impact, you know, the, the success of, of PRISM and, um, you know, what does it, what does it do for, for PRISM from a, you know, sales revenue standpoint? Yeah, from the beginning, it's just been an important part of, um, our daily practice. So going back to what I said, I would post pictures and girls would want the outfits. And then um, I hired my first employee who is now a a freelance um, photographer and content creator for me. Um, And I was like, Hey, I can't keep up with this. Like, can you post the outfits? And then turns out she was a lot better at it (laughs) than I was. Um, And from the beginning, you know, we would post the outfits and we would do photo shoots. And I, I would really spend a lot of money on these photo shoots for what we were making. But I, you know, I do feel like over the course of these years, I've put so much of like my, you know, what could have been more, you know, maybe more profits, but into building a brand that these women, you know, want to be part of. And they, you know, we basically, we curate for them. So we go out and we shop for all the big brands and the small brands and we curate like this really cool selection. And then we put it together. A lot of it is on social media. So when you see, you know, we call them flat lays and that's when the outfit's laid out flat. Like there might be like 15 brands in that photo and we've curated, you know, it together. And we've kind of told the girls like, this is the cool stuff. Like this is what's in for fall or, you know, these are what everyone's wearing for the swimsuits this year. So we really kind of built our brand, um, the image um, and the aesthetic of it uh, through social media and through Instagram. And again, at that time, I didn't really even know how important social media was going to become to my business, but it was just like fun to like, you know, post a picture of a cute girl wearing an outfit and then have it sell. And, you know, when we tapped in, it was really before, you know, the Instagram algorithm and the advertising and, 
before it became this ginormous business, we kind of tapped in and were able to grow our following much quickly. A lot of people say, how do I, how do I do that? Well, it's, you know, there is no format or I think everybody would do it. Um, and it's just, you know, you have to create this like inspiring original content um, that people want to see and you have to have these beautiful photos and all that takes talent, time, planning, money. Um, you know, it may look very easy and I think that's a lot of social media. It's like, oh, I just was standing at this beach in the bikini. You know, no, there's a full photo shoot around that with, you know, wardrobe, hair and makeup and, you know, all the things. And that's what social media, you know, a lot of times looks so easy, but you know, any, any large company and even us, like we have a whole team around that now. Um, we didn't at the beginning and for, you know, several years, it was just me and the one employee just doing it all. And we didn't really like have a plan. Like now we have a marketing calendar and, you know, the social media correlates with the emails going out and new collection launches. And now it's very planned. Um, which I think definitely helps. But at the time, you know, when we were building, it was very organic. And I think people actually like that too. And kind of more spur in the moment, like go out and take a cute photo and then put it up. Now we, we don't operate like that anymore. Um, but it really allowed people to find us. Um, whereas other boutiques, you know, they just, they don't have that following. And so, you know, they have their, probably their clientele and their community and you know, of course, other people will find them click, click, you know, we're all clicking and then you find a cute store or someone that interests you or whatever it is. But the more engagement and kind of followers you have, the more and people are engaging with the brand, the more uh, other people see it. And it just kind of snowballed pretty quickly. Um, and it still is like we're still growing quickly. And I think we've just identified ourselves as this brand that you know, um, curates and, and is ahead with the fashion and all of that. Um, something that is so important too is just like collaborating with brands. So, you know, we would make a cute picture of the girl in the outfit. This is my example for today, apparently. And then the brand would say, oh, well, that's our dress. They tagged us and then they would repost the photo and then their followers would click on us. Um, and so we did a lot of collaboration and I think that's been something that, um, with social media and then just with all, you know, facets of our business, collaboration has just been something that's been so huge in getting the word out there. Um, and yeah, social media is, you know, just become just like a backbone of our business, of our market. It's, mar it's our main you know, that and now emails or it's our main marketing tool to get out to, you know, people. And then even, you know, years ago when our website didn't do anywhere close to the business that it does now, you know, we would literally get girls coming into the store and saying, I, I live in this state and I came to Los Angeles and I rented a car so I could come down and see your store. <laughs> and, you know, international travelers, like people coming in from all different countries because they found us on Instagram and that's how powerful it is that you can reach people all over and that they can want to come see your store when they come to California and make it part of their road trip or whatever it is. And it just, you know, was a tool to really just get the word out to people. But I will say, even if you have a hundred thousand followers, that does not mean you have a hundred thousand customers. So you know, of course, we're trying to always get people, you know, now that it's become over the last few years, like such a tool, such a marketing tool, and you can click on the outfit and, and buy it. Um, it's become an even more important part of our business. And um, it, it is like a marketing tool. But it also too, um, really, I feel like a lot of like the community that we've created around Prism, like kind of lives on social media. And, you know, one of the things that we're very passionate about is working with like small brands and artists and vendors. So we will, you know, um, we will shot them out on Instagram and, you know, do photos of their ceramics, let's say, and we'll tag them. And then, you know, they'll, they'll tag us and they'll get their followers to look at us. And we are known to kind of be like a leader in that. And I think it's created like this kind of like, inclusive brand, you know, family around Prism. Um, and a lot of that just with Instagram just made it kind of spread like wildfire um, in a way so we could reach so many people. And 
we've, I feel like we've helped build a lot of like smaller brands and artists and like one, you know, one woman shows, you know, she makes ceramics or she makes, you know, whatever it is. Um, we've been able to kind of help them grow, which I feel really just comes back and helps us grow, if that makes sense. And we've grown with a lot of these brands that we've carried for many years and um, collaborated with them and worked with them. And, um, you know, something that was very important, this is getting off the topic of social media, but was, you know, doing events um, was a huge part of, you know, Prism's culture. Um, and we would promote those on social media and we would have these, you know, all types of events in the store, out, outside of the store. Um, and then we would put it all on social media and then, you know, other people from far away, oh, I wish I could be there. And they're following along and they're meeting the vendors that make all the goods that we sell at Prism. And it's just been able to like, you know, make the reach of our community so much larger. Um, and yeah, it's such a, an incredible tool for us. So it's a, it's a big part of our day to day still. Um, in the last a uh, year and a half, I now have a social media coordinator, so I don't have to do the posts anymore. Um, I don't know how I did that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but now I have a marketing team and it's much more cohesive and, you know, more, more beautiful photos and we're able to, you know, really elevate that. Um, and it's just, yeah, been a huge tool in helping with our growth. Yeah. So I, I want to ask you a little bit about, uh, you know, hiring a marketing coordinator, how long you waited, how you, how you turned your followers and community into a customer base, but let's first take a quick message or a quick break to hear a message from our sponsor. And we'll come back and talk about that. Okay. Whether you're an established local company or a brand new startup, you can count on GBS to be part of your family. We're not just any benefits consulting firm, we're GBS. We have nearly 30 years of experience in group benefits, a strong sense of purpose, and it shows. GBS, believe in something better. GBSbenefits.com. All right, welcome back, Tycoons. We are here with Dana Mance with Prism Boutique in Long Beach, California. I almost said Los Angeles. It's part of Los Angeles, but... Um, yeah. Yeah. So we're talking a little bit about social media and, you know, building that community and having a customer base, and then you've got to translate that into sales, right? So I want to hit on that real quick. But um, one thing that you just really kind of intrigued me with is, you know, you've been open seven and a half years and you just now hired a social media coordinator. And I think a lot of businesses hire social media coordinators way too early, way earlier than they need. And it's an expense that they can't really afford to be honest with you and, and can eventually lead to failure if they're if they're just wrong about it so give us some feedback on on why you chose to wait and and uh you know how you made the selection i guess of, of who you hired at this point yeah so we hired uh one about uh a year between a year and a year and a half ago and for you know for having a large following and doing it ourselves it at that point it just kind of wasn't working anymore. It, you know, our engagement was kind of down and it was just time to really take that leap. Um, and you know, we had a pretty good sized business by the point, by the time I did that, I do encourage people at the beginning to like still run their Instagram because you know, they are the face behind the brand and they're not so big where they should just be disconnected. Um, you can, you know, there's a lot of young people who are doing social media and you can hire someone freelance, you know, for probably not too large of a fee, um, that does it very part-time. Um, so that's always an option too, but, um, we just got to the point where we just needed everything to flow when we needed like a marketing calendar and we needed a, a team. And, um, it was just with, you know, the, the woman who does, you know, my website and my emails who has the marketing background, she just hit the point where she's like, we need more help. Like this is not, it's not working. And it was kind of during the time where Instagram algorithm was, you know, you really had to kind of learn how to get your engagement up or pay to play with the advertising. And I would like to touch on that later advertising with social media, because that's been a huge game changer for Prism. Um, but yes, it, um, it was just time and we needed everything to like, you know, if we're launching a new collection or, we're even just doing new arrivals, like an email, like it should be the same message on Instagram and it should be part of a calendar and a flow where things are planned. And so we've grown a lot in the last, 
uh, year with doing that and really planning out the month and coming up, um, you know, with blog content and emails and, you know, events and, you know, just a basically marketing campaigns, um, all kind of based on the products that we have coming into the store, so, which is basically just trying to sell our goods. <laughs> um, so yeah, Instagram has definitely just been like a, a, a very important tool. And, you know, now they have like the buy button where people can click on it and it takes you to the product and you can buy it right there or you can click through to the website. So it's basically a tool to get people onto the website. Then there's a whole nother job with the website and that is making sure it functions properly and it's, you know, organized and it's a really good website or else you're going to lose people really fast. Um, so it's basically, you know, between Instagram and emailers, which are another very important part of our marketing, that is the way to get people onto the website. And then our goal from that is to get them to convert because not everyone that goes to the website is buying something. We all know how much we go and look and we don't buy anything. Um, and then converting that into a sale and into a customer. And then once we have a customer, um, you know, so a huge part of social media is getting those people to be a customer and whether, you know, they buy something or they sign up for our email list, getting their emails is incredibly important, um, you know, to build an email campaign list, um, and be able to market, um, into their inboxes. Um, so that's been, it's, you know, social media is just one of the pieces of the pie of getting people to, to buy. <laughs> <laughs> from us. So, um, and it's, it's an, it's a brand image and, you know, no matter what you do, there is an image on social media. You will lose people so fast. Like if your content isn't good and your photos or it's not engaging and it's very difficult, um, to navigate and it changes quickly too. Um, just for example, this week, Instagram launched something new called reels. And I'm like, I feel like I'm just getting old. I'm like, Oh my gosh, it's all changing so fast. Good for me. <laughs> You know, and I do have a team that does this for me now, so I'm a little more on the outside of it. I'm like, it changes so quickly. Like, you know, two years ago, we didn't even have Instagram stories. We would just post a photo and sell from that, and then stories jumped in, and then we're selling from stories, and we're linking to products there. And it, I mean, it, just when you think you got the hang of it, it's going to change. <laughs> so, and that, you know, how, how your business can kind of adapt and use those tools um, is really important. I think for all types of small business. Yeah. You've got to stay on that cutting edge unless your last name's Kardashian, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then it just comes to you. Please put this on, please tag us in your post Oh my gosh. and we'll pay you $10 million. <laughs> yeah, and that's a whole nother, you know, part of social media is working with influencers. I mean, it's a huge, yep. You know, we now have a PR girl um, and she, you know, gets us in publications and she does, in, you know, influencer outreach. And I can't speak for all, in, all industries, but for fashion, I can say that influencers are an important part of uh, the fashion industry. And um, that wasn't even probably a job five years ago or 10 years ago. Like that, that didn't even exist. Yeah. And now it's a real job. <laughs> yeah, Where, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, there's so many intricacies and, um, you know, I got to the point with my business that I couldn't, I wasn't the expert anymore and it was time to hire experts and hire a team to do it. I, I just couldn't do it anymore, nor did I have the skill set. So it was time to kind of let go and let a team where this is what they, their ex expertise are in social media and marketing and let them kind of um, take the reins with that. I still lead the ship and, you know, I, um, I control the product coming in, which essentially leads to the marketing. So I'm kind of at the head of the ship, but then I have the marketing team now, um, that makes it all happen. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, with the face like your brother has, if you dressed him, cause we know he doesn't have any fashion sense of his own. If you dressed him, he could be an influencer for you. <laughs> I think he could. Yes, he did not get the fashion gene. He's just a regular dude. Yeah. <laughs> see, see, net kickball in net. Yes. That's not. That's about the extent of what I can do. <laughs> yeah, it's a very yeah specific industry, but I will say it's a lot of fun. Yeah, I want to mention something real quick. Sorry, Austin, if I'm cutting you off, but no, you're not. You know, I, I, I think that your story is just so 
cool and unique that I, I really think that it, it, it's inspiration for people out there that are thinking about starting a business or have maybe uh, you know, recently started a business and are you know, struggling to get things off, off the ground. You know? And I, I think your story is just a testament to uh, you know, entrepreneurs that are essentially starting with nothing. You, know, you, got, you, know, you said 10, 15,000 bucks, a 600 square foot you know, retail location. And now you've got, uh, you know, what, what's the square footage now of, of Prism Long Beach? So we have three spaces. It, it feels like one space when you come in. And then more recently, we um, brought on about 1,500 square feet office and uh, workplace and kind of shipment processing, like a fulfillment center and, you know, just workspace. Um, we brought that on a few months ago. So I finally have my own office after all these years. Yeah. <laughs> that we're well, they, you know, in business, we, uh, we hear about the iceberg analogy, which some people know, some people may not, but you know, you, you only see the tip of the iceberg, which people see you now as you are today and you are a successful businesswoman and an entrepreneur ha who has not only survived, but thrived in an industry that is very, very difficult to do what you have done. So I, I just think it's, it's just really cool uh, that uh, your, your story is, um, is real. And for people that are listening, know that, you know, if you're thinking about starting a business or you started your business, it's okay that, you know, you might be struggling, your sales might be really low, uh, but, you know, sticking it out, um, having that, that grit, um, eventually, you know, you can build a business. Anybody can build a business to a point where, you know, you've got the social media team, the marketing team, you know, different layers of management. So uh, I just uh, want to mention that because I just think it's uh, uh really good inspiration for people that are either thinking about starting a business or you have recently started one to, to know that you can really, you know, start from nothing and build and build a business into something that's really, really cool and unique. Yeah. And I think for that, you know, is finding what you're passionate about because you have to work at it every single day. Like, and one thing that is, you know, may set me apart from others is I don't waver with like my level of motivation. I am so focused on this business, like the same amount of focus that I have today is like what I had on like day one. And that for a lot of people is very difficult because there is so many discouraging things that can happen. And believe me, I have been through many of those. Um, and you, I mean, grit was a really good word. You know, you just, you have to, you have have something inside of yourself. that's like just incredibly motivated no matter what, happens and just you have to be willing to really get your feet you know your hands dirty feet dirty and you got to just get dirty with it and you know get through the hard times and you know I mean obviously you know this year has been such an unusual year and you know prism is no exception like we've been through a ton with COVID I mean just from the start when they're like you have to shut your two boutiques when I just opened a third in Los Angeles and I worked really hard on this pop-up shop and, you know, if you open a pop-up shop, you're opening another business. You do all the same things, but it's a temporary shop. And I had just opened it and I was really focused on like growing my brick and mortar um, business in Southern California. And um, it was like, oh, you got to shut down. And I mean, I was just like, I could not, it was like, you know, <laughs> trying to tell a small business owner to like stop when all we do is just like keep barreling forward every single day, month, year. It's it was, yeah, very abrupt and PRISM definitely went, has gone through a lot um, this year, but I will say um, that I feel like everything is kind of coming out positive from it, which, you know, if you had told me that during certain months in March and April and May, I would have not believed you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we did close a location. So I closed my second boutique location um, and we were just about coming up on our two year lease and, uh, the shopping center that I was in and I worked so hard to, you know, get the second, you know, second location up and running and to grow the customer base and the team. And, you know, it's just so much work for a small business to have a second location. And, um, 
the shopping center just basically was not working with us and our lease was about to be up. And so I got out a little bit early and, you know, it was, it was hard, but I just knew, I was like, I just got to get out of here. <laughs> like my gut just told me, I, I think I've always just followed my business gut and, you know, people were like, Oh, I'm so sorry. And, you know, just so kind, but I was like, I'm fine. It's like, I'm just ready to close that chapter. And with doing that, um, and with our Long Beach being store being closed for three months, we were able to really focus on our online business in a way that we've never been able to focus on it before. Um, and we've been able to put all of our energy into that. And I feel like all those years of building an online business, all the work um, kind of just like paid off and like we were able to just build upon this base that we had built and worked at for so many years and um just give it our all and it was just it's just blossomed like tremendously in the last few months and i feel like if i was still trying to run three stores i would not be able to focus on that and now i'm just happy to be more simple and not have that second and that third location and have one location that, you know, we have such a loyal customer base and then we can really focus on our online business. And of course I always knew, you know, that was where it was at, but my passion was the store experience and creating these beautiful stores for women to come in and ooh and ah and shop and have this experience and doing all these amazing events and pouring so much heart and soul into these events to bring people in and bring the community together. And obviously with COVID, that's not even on the table anymore. So we've had to adapt our business so much. And I, I learned with a small team um, that we can be so nimble and adapt so quickly where I could see other large retailers or large companies. I mean, it's so difficult for them to make changes and make them quickly. And we were able to do that. And, you know, it was immediately like focus on the online that's all we got to pay our bills <laughs> and we have this inventory here and we had no idea this was coming and we just put it all into that and it's just been like explosive in the last um four to five months so it's been a lot of fun it's we've had a lot of growing pains um definitely um but it's i feel like we're in such a better place now than we were before covid and i'm happy to simplify and be focusing online and um, yeah, so it's, I would say we're in a positive place compared to where we were, but it's been a hard road. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, I think COVID has been tough on, on almost everybody, right? I mean, yeah. some companies didn't even really skip a beat because they were able to pivot so quickly. Um, or they were already doing something that, you know, made sense in, in the midst of a pandemic. And so it, it all, you know, kind of worked out for them, but, you know, a guest that we had on a few months ago talked, you know, uses this terminology when you're making decisions inside of your business that you're always looking at each aspect and saying, do I persevere? Do I pivot? Or do I perish? Right. And the pivot and the perish is really hard to do for a lot of business owners. And a lot of business owners will persevere way too long down a road, right? You told us about your history and growing up with Urban Inc. and anthropology and all those sorts of things. And they do things a certain way. And it's about that customer experience, right? So that was all of your experience. But you were able to still take a step back in the midst of this pandemic. And one could say you were forced, but I don't know that you were truly forced. But you were able to take a step back and say, all right, this is the time. We've got to focus on online. And this is how we're going to come out of this stronger, now, will you ever shut down the boutique? I, I think you probably won't, right? I mean, you'll go right back to doing the pop-up shops and you'll do the events at the, at the store and those sorts of things. But it's given you an opportunity to really capitalize on what's out there from an online standpoint. And that's, that's awesome to see. Yeah, it's been fun. Um, we've learned a lot. And, you know, I'm just trying to create that experience for people online. And that's like through the website and the social media and I still feel like people can get that prism experience through, you know, the online experience. Um, and it's just so amazing how many more people we can reach. And when you focus on something, really focus on like an aspect of your business that can bring you so much more revenue, what can happen? <laughs> so I was like, I should have done this, you know, uh, years ago, but I just didn't have the capacity and I was just in a different, you know, phase of the business and focused elsewhere. 
Um, so it's been really eye opening, and um, you know, it is also a different business. You know, and all, having an all, like a, a much larger online store, um, and all the the you know part moving parts of making that happen is just so different from like a retail experience. So um, I have a great team, and I think that's something that you know you can't do this without really good people working for you that are willing to kind of you know help you bring your vision to life and help you pivot and um, make all the moving parts happen. Um, they've been a huge part of that. Yeah. So you, you've been able to, uh, you know, we keep using the word pivot. So you've been able to successfully pivot to where you're doing a majority of your business online right now. So with that being said, you know, what, what does the future look like for Prism? You know, do you move into this model of hundred percent online or do you, do you not, do you continue with the brick and mortars kind of, Talk to us for a minute. What, what's, what does it look like for PRISM here in the next 12, 24, 36 months? Well, I think now, um, before PRISM was a boutique with an online store. Now we are an online store with a boutique. Um, I'm still not willing to give up my brick and mortar experience and our little boutique for, you know, um, you know, it cannot do the volume that an online business can that we can access people all over the country and internationally but it does a, a good little portion we have a really good community that we've built of customers over the years so we will still operate that with all of our covid restrictions which have become the new normal um but the next yeah yeah year is basically is growing this online business and the way, um, you know, I, one of the main parts of my job is I buy the inventory, I select the inventory and then we sell it. I do have an assistant that helps me, but I kind of lead the way and the way that I've had to change how I buy for this larger business is, you know, it's happened very quickly where I'm, you know, let's say I used to buy 12 to 18 of a dress. Now I, I need to buy 50 or do I take a risk and like, you know, and buy more and more. And so we're growing our inventory and kind of realizing what we can do. Um, and it's just going to be about growing this business online and going back, I touched on, you know, events being such a big part of, um, Prism's identity, um, is that we're now doing pop-ups online. And I haven't seen a ton of people doing that yet. Um, vintage um, was a big, big event for us. We'd have all these vintage vendors on the sidewalk and we would bring hundreds of people out for these sidewalk events. And, you know, obviously we can't do that anymore. And we love to showcase these, you know, brands that we believe in, these vintage vendors. So we've been doing online pop-ups and then we're already starting to talk about the holiday season is coming. And what can we do to be a leader? What can we do to set ourselves apart? Um, in throughout the holiday season, where usually we're having small business Saturday is a huge day for small business retail, um, you know, across the country. And obviously the holidays in December, we do, you know, three to four times what we do on an average month. So it's such an important time that's coming. And we're just starting to talk about with our team, what can we do to set ourselves apart um, and basically do these events where we're still like showcasing these artists, and you can, you know, meet them and read about them on the blog and shop their goods and their exclusive pieces that they've made for Prism and work with me on these art pieces. So we're, we're kind of gearing to um, prepare for that season and how to be a leader and how to just think outside the box right now um, going into, you know, uh, the holiday season during a pandemic. So, um, yeah, so we're putting a lot of thought and planning into that. I think that's really cool. The online pop-up shop. I don't know. I mean, not that I'm a retail expert by any stretch, but I don't think I've ever heard that term even before. But I'm, you know, as you're describing that, I'm starting to think to myself how, how that would look and, you know, how you advertise for that and how you pull it off. And I, I think it could be a really cool experience still, right? I mean, Landon and I have done more Zoom meetings in the last six months than we've done in our entire lives, right? And, you know, I've onboarded brand new clients from start to finish that I've never met face to face. And that's a first for me in a 20 year career. So we've all had to pivot and figure out other ways to still be successful. So I think that you're obviously a very smart person that you understand your, your customer base, you understand what it is that you're trying to build. And like you said, seven and a half years in and you've still got the same passion that you had on day one. 
And so if I had to say, Dana, what's the, what's the one, number one thing that you love most about your job? What would you tell me? Oh, um, well, I got into it because I just love to shop. Um, but <laughs> I, oh man, there's so many things that I love. I, I guess my biggest love would be just being the curator. So um, selecting the products and making this assortment and just making it something that people just kind of can't resist. Um, we've brought on a lot of other categories. So we're, we're primarily like a women's clothing store, but we sell shoes, hats, accessories, all the home good categories and gifts and curating that and picking each item and finding like this, this little brand that I'll find on Instagram and I'll, you know, oh, they have the most unique candles and they're out of Brooklyn, New York, and I'm gonna contact them and I'm gonna bring their candles into the store and then I'm gonna share it with my customers. I think it's like the curation and then being able to kind of like, you know, add that to our assortment and our collection and, you know, just making it where, you know, women go onto the website and they're just like, oh my gosh, I want everything. Like everything is so beautiful, like from the home goods to the clothes and the shoes and the sunglasses and all that. So I think, you know, buying the goods and then um, being able to turn around and share them and sell them. That's probably my favorite. There's a lot of, a lot of things that I love about it though. <laughs> Well, we, we are uh, bumping up on, on time here, but, uh, you know, I think uh, Austin will agree with me when, when I say that, uh, you know, you, you are a true tycoon, a small business owner that, you know, who's sounds like, I mean, really part of your mission is to support and help grow other small businesses that were, you know, once maybe in, in, in a spot that you were in. So, you know, our hats off to you. Um, you know, you, you are a true tycoon and we, uh, uh, certainly learned a lot. I'm sure that our listeners got a lot out of this. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, verbal gold, you know, we, we got from you. So, um, thank you so much for joining us. Really enjoyed it. And, uh, I love you. Love you. <laughs> you guys had a lot of fun. And I would say you're clearly the smarter and better looking <laughs> member of the family. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not good, um, I'm not, I don't have the financial, um, you know, the experience that Jake or Landon has, you know, um, so he's got more of like that. So I just need him to come be like a full time <laughs> really take this business to the next level. So we'll see. Yeah. Just keep me behind closed doors. though. So, okay. You don't want to, you don't, you don't want to expose me to your people. Yeah. So I'll just give you a makeover. I'll be fine. All right. Well, thanks well, again. Yeah. Why don't you hit us real quick with your website and uh, Instagram handle so that our listeners know how to find you. Yeah. Okay. So our online shop is prismboutique.com and our Instagram handle is at prismboutique. So we're pretty easy to find um, and definitely go check out the website and the, and the Instagram. Got some really beautiful stuff. So everyone needs to be shopping for their wives if they're not a lady. <laughs> well yeah no my wife's birthday is coming up so i will definitely check it out awesome thanks for having me yeah thanks so You're much welcome. for being here we appreciate it you've been listening to tycoons of small biz proudly hosted by austin peterson and landon mance Austin and Landon are comprehensive financial planning professionals specializing in financial, estate, and succession planning for small business owners. Austin and Landon have offices in Scottsdale, Arizona, and Las Vegas, Nevada, and represent clients in 14 states throughout the country. Join Austin, Landon, and the Featured Tycoons live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. right here on Business Radio X and your favorite podcast platform. All right, we did it. <laughs> it went by pretty fast, actually. So fast, it doesn't did. it? It does. It goes by quickly. It really does. I think this is the first time I've witnessed the guys just sit in, in just in complete awe and <laughs> and listening as opposed to more banter back and forth. 
It's because you were just this gift that kept giving. It was really fascinating. <laughs> I went on a tangent. What was the question? <laughs> no, I, I, I just did a podcast. Uh, I was a guest a couple of weeks ago, and I said the same thing probably three or four times. Did I answer your question? Because I feel like I went down seven different rabbit holes, but I don't feel that way about you at all. I know where you're coming from, but it was great, really. And, and then I loved just the questions, because this is a very different guest and different industry than what we've had before. Yeah. Uh, but it just was so great the way you, you know, from a business perspective and an entrepreneur perspective, the guys would frame up those questions that we're just all curious about. Yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. good stuff. Uh, so um, I will send the audio file back to Atlanta to have them master the sound. And then um, thank you again for submitting that guest form. Angie also in Atlanta will upload that so that it's the content piece that supports the podcast. And then uh, in the next day or two, we'll have it turned around for you. We'll send you a link to the podcast and then the video will be in a folder as well as a couple of the photos that I'm going to take right now. Yeah, I'll definitely share it once we, it's all ready to get. We hope so. And the one thing I didn't think to ask, um, or that I, I thought to ask, but I don't want to interrupt the, interrupt the guys and pass a note. What would you say is the age range for the majority of your clientele? What, who's, your, who's your best client? Uh, about 25 to 40. Okay, then I need to introduce you to my Brooklyn daughter. She works for Red Bull, and she's a little bit of a Instagram worthy, famous kind of kid, like, you know, I mean, only 10,000 followers, but she oh. gets free stuff all the time. Oh. And if there's ever something that you would want her to, uh, you know, purchase and model, maybe send it mom's way and I'll get it for her. And then she can put it out there and, and share it. She's, she's was home for COVID. Now she's back in Brooklyn. And because she was home for a period of time, I, every day, there's something new in the mail for her that, that people are sending, you know, the routine they want, they want uh, attention. Uh, from from kiddos like that. So I'm happy to make an introduction if you feel that's appropriate. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Let me hop up. Uh, let's see. I think I want to make sure I got enough photos of the two of you in the studio. Yeah, those are good. So if I can have you guys take your headsets off and switch places with me, we'll have you stand on either side of the screen there and let me turn off our video. We're still here, but I'm going to get rid of the studio shot here. Oh, I hear it. Sure. All right. You can hear me okay? Give me a thumbs up. Yeah, very good. All right. Cute. And looking at me, perfect, one, two, three, smiling. Yep, beautiful, smile again. Nice, guys looking at your guest. Yay! And one more looking this way, big smile, everybody. Very fun. All right. Thank you so much. And thanks for uh, being patient with me while I make fun of your, your brother. That's kind of my, my shtick. <laughs> yeah, we have fun. We have fun. That's great. Yeah. Thanks, honey. Thanks, that was, guys. That was awesome. Okay, we'll let you get back to your day. All right. Have a good afternoon. Yeah, you Thank too. You. Love you. Bye. Love you. Bye.